الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا حبيبنا محمد عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا أما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله إن الله يأمر بالعد والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون My brothers and sisters I've recited from um, Surah number 16 and verse number 90 Usually we recite this verse to end the khutbah as a reminder but today I decided to read it before just so that we can understand the meaning of this verse and apply it in the context in our living today the story goes a man came to Rasul a man who was non-Muslim Arab probably a Bedouin unsophisticated very brash very crass in his manner and behavior he said to Prophet oh Muhammad, tell me about you. Who are you? Oh Muhammad, tell me about your religion, the one you've been preaching to everybody. He had two questions to the Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet answered very simply. He said, I am Muhammad ibn Abdullah and Rasul Allah. I am the son of Muhammad and I am also the messenger of Allah. That's all he said. Please note how he answered this question. I am the son of Abdullah, Muhammad ibn Abdullah and Rasulullah and Allah's messenger. Prophet was never in the habit of overplaying his personal importance. He's never inflated his own introduction. He is not a person who liked pomposity, self-exaggeration. He did not like conceit. He always preferred to remain ordinary amongst his companions who were ordinary. He never hesitated to mingle amongst the Bedouin uneducated Arabs. He never treated anyone unequally, but everyone who came to his company felt very special. He invited people through his personality, his benevolence, and his magnanimous character. His message, my brothers and sisters, was always unique, to the point, precise, understandable, digestible, even by the most ordinary people. And his response was always confined to the wisdom that he received from the revelation from him Azza wa Jal. I want you to think about Muhammad and I want you to understand what the Prophet was like. Somebody comes and says, Oh Muhammad, who are you? He doesn't say, I am Hazrat Mawlana, Allama, Shaykh. He doesn't say any of that. He doesn't say none of those. And yet many of our shayukh like longer titles before their names. Not all of them. Many of our brothers like to give grand titles to people that they invite for talks and programs. It is as though unless those grand titles are given before these people, these scholars, this scholar's knowledge will somehow be diminished. And yet Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Uswatun Hasana, the best example that we can have, whenever somebody asked him, Oh Muhammad, who are you? He said, I am Muhammad ibn Abdullah, I am the son of Abdullah and Rasulullah and Prophet of Allah. Nothing more. This pomposity that we see, I call it the cult of the shuyukh nowadays. Shaykh, 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 Subhanallah, stop it. Stop it for Allah's sake. You don't have to worship the man for his knowledge. Respect him, of course. Respect doesn't come with 
prefixes of long title. If you go to Asian subcontinent, Azim, the title is longer than the man's name. This is not how Rasul Sallallahu introduced himself to the world. Allah introduces Prophet very benevolently, very beautifully, magnanimously in the Quran. He says that in the Quran, Muhammad is Rahmatul Lil Alameen. Allah, the Lord of the universe, can give titles to whom he likes. He can honor whom he likes and he can take away honor from whom he likes. It is in his hand. But it is not in your own hand. It is not in our own hand to give grand title and grand, you know, give people exaggerated labels. It's not acceptable. Rasulullah was the best man ever to walk this earth. But he was humble and he always liked mingling with his normal people. He never asked for special position special favors. He never asked for VIP suits for himself. He never asked for anything extraordinary. I go around the country, my brothers and sisters, and I see lectures and speakers and scholars coming. And I sometimes feel sick to the core when I hear their demands. I'm not going to travel unless you put me on a first class ticket. I'm not going to travel unless you give me a five star hotel. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to I keep, I turn around to those brothers and say, don't invite such people because there is no baraka in such arrogance and haughtiness. <laughs> I want to bring this back to our home now. I've seen the titles of your scholars coming here. I've seen the long titles that you've put. Why not just put the brother's name and put a small description underneath it? Why do you need to put Mawlana? I ask the people of subcontinent. Mawlana is Allah. Allah is our Mawla. Why do you call a human being Mawlana? Why? Oh brother, it is our Asian tradition. But Asian tradition in contradiction to Allah Allah is the Mawla. Then they call it Hazrat, another word. How, you know where, where Hazrat comes from? It comes from the concept of uh, how the, somebody who is present. Somebody who is in Pakistan and Bangladesh, he is not present, why call him Hazrat? Originally, it comes from that root word. But we have used it to give grand title and grand status to people. Brothers and sisters, we must be very careful of not doing this because Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't. So the man asked Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi two questions. <coughs> Please tell me about you. And he introduced himself as a humble, normal, ordinary man. And a prophet. And the second question he answered by reciting the verse that I just read. Inna allaha ya'muru bil'adhi wal-ihsan wa ita'i dil-qurba وَيَنْهَا عَنَ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغِيِ يَعِذُكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكَّرُونَ And he gave what I call the constitution of Islamic morals and manners in one verse of Him Azza wa Jal in succinct manner, in the most profound way that nobody would have any doubts about what Islam is. If a non-Muslim comes to you and I today, unfortunately, Islam has become synonymous with beheading. Islam has become synonymous with extremism. Islam, is, have become, Islam has become synonymous with hatred, with violence, with constant troubles and tribulations. I am sick and tired of answering on your behalf, I'm telling you. When they called me up for a television interview or radio interview, the other day I said, I'm, I'm sick of those questions. I actually said this on the live program. My face is blue. Stop asking me those questions. But Islam has become synonymous with wrong things today. Don't blame the non-Muslims for it. We are responsible for the way Islam is being presented because we have failed in presenting Islam adequately. And this is what Rasulullah said. Look at the way Rasulullah said. He said, Islam is about Allah is telling you, Allah is ordering you that you should be just to everybody. That you should be doing good. You should be generous towards your fellow human being. He forbids you from all shameful deeds. He forbids you from evil and he forbids you from rebellion. Three orders and three prohibitions in one verse. Very simple. Three orders and three prohibitions. And that's all Rasulullah said. How long did it take for him to explain Islam to this Bedouin? No more than a minute. How long does it take to read this verse? Inna Allah ya'mu biladhi wal ihsan wa ita idhil qurba wa yanha anil fahshai wal munkar wal baghi. Together. Ya'adukum la'allakum tadakkaroon. 10 seconds. It took me 10 seconds to read this verse. And that's all Rasulullah said to this Bedouin. An introduction to Islam in 10 seconds. How many of us 
actually do this to a non-Muslim when they ask us about Islam? There are three commands and three prohibitions. Look at the commands and look at the prohibitions, my dear brothers and sisters. Allah Azza wa Jal says, and justice and fair play, He is ordering you to do. The essence of our faith, essence of Allah, closest to Allah, taqwa of Allah, worship of Allah, his rabba, all is dependent on one thing, and that is Abdul. Inna Allah ya'muru bil Abdul. He orders you, He orders you to be just and fair. What justice do we see today in the world? Muslims are miserably failing to do justice to themselves. Forget about everybody else. Justice is the cornerstone of our faith. <coughs> he Azzawajal says, Justice must be served at all costs, at all times. <coughs> Never should your personal interest, hatred of other people, or subjective world view detract you or deter you from serving and delivering justice. Remember what Allah says in the Quran? Never allow the hatred of other people to prevent you from being just. How is it just to behead? How is it just to behead two journalists in Iraq? How is it just? Or is it the spin doctrine that has used the social media, create the biggest hype and publicity possible? Wallahi, every injustice, whether done by Muslims or non-Muslims, will have to be answered on the Day of Judgment. If American drones are killing our brothers and sisters in Yemen and Afghanistan, America will face its question on the Day of Judgment. And if Muslims are beheading journalists in Iraq and other parts of the world, the Muslims will face their questions on the Day of Judgment. Every action you do, good or bad, you should see it on the Day of Judgment. You shall be asked whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim. You will not get away with it. Just because you're Muslim, it doesn't give you justification to or slaughter people. Where is justice? Where is justice? Where is justice in Muslim world today? Name me one Muslim country that serves justice or tries to serve justice. The king's own whims, the prince's own desire, the corrupt elite and regime's own personal interest often overtakes any concept of justice. Whether it's in Pakistan or Saudi Arabia, whether it is Indonesia or Africa, it's happening in every Muslim country today. <coughs> when the non-Muslims ask, you tell us, Quran divines Islam in three orders and three prohibitions. Let us tell you that all Muslims have failed in following the first order, which is, in Allah ya'muru bil adl. Establish justice. Muslims have failed. No, Muslims say that to me every day. You guys have failed miserably to serve justice, my friend. Don't give me preaching of Islam. They're right. We have failed. We have failed in delivering justice to the world. <coughs> Don't blame others for the failure of injustice inside <coughs> our own selves. Number two. Wal ihsan, Allah says, and pursuit of excellence. This is a very beautiful one. When Rasulullah said to, uh, when Jibreel said to Muhammad, oh Muhammad, tell me about Islam, about Iman. The third one was Ihsan. Jibreel asked Rasulullah, you know that hadith of Rasulullah, hadith of Umar al Khattab, they say. Very beautiful hadith, the wrong one. The last part, when Rasulullah asked, oh Muhammad, tell us about Ihsan. Rasulullah said, Ihsan is to worship Allah as though you can see Him. If you can't imagine that, then know that he sees you. It's a mindset. It's about trying to do your best at everything. Excellence at everything. You must excel all the things that you do to the best of your, of your ability. If you're a driver, you must be the best driver. If you're an engineer, you must be the best engineer. You should try to be the best engineer. If you are a poet, you must be the best poet in the world. If you're a philosopher, you should try to be the best philosopher in the world. If you're a husband, you should be the best husband in the world. If you're a wife, you should be the best wife in the world. If you're a child, you should be the best child to your parents. Everything must be delivered to the best of your ability. And this is what Allah says, Ihsan is. Ihsan is to facilitate the best. Not just by yourself, but for other people. Help others to do best. Facilitate, Rasulullah said. 
Make it easy for them. Yassiru wa la Make it easy for them. Don't make it difficult for them. Bashiru, give them good news and don't give them bad news. Facilitate, encourage people, motivate people so they can do good. Empower people that there is a future tomorrow. That's what Ihsan is. And Allah is ordering the second order in the same verse. First one is Adl, justice. Second one is Ihsan, excellence. And the non-Muslims say to me, please tell us that you have passed your test on excellence. You haven't. You haven't passed your test in excellence. And I agree that we have failed in being the best that the world could be. We cheat. We litter our street. We spit as we walk the streets. We disregard the rights of our neighbors. We don't keep our promises. We often break our time promise. If a wedding is supposed to start at one, they don't start until three o'clock. And I see many times it happens. I'm invited to the wedding. I'm in the front waiting for the bride and the groom to come so I can do the nikah for them. The white man and white woman are there waiting. The Asians and the Muslims and the Arabs and the Pakistanis and all the others are not there yet. What time will they be coming? Uh, we are following GMT, brother. What is GMT? Generous Muslim time. What? Generous Muslim time? GMT? It's supposed to be Greenwich Mean Time. Forget that! Allah Azza wa Jal swears by the name of time. He says, fulfill your promises in the Quran. Excellence, my brothers, is about doing everything in the best way possible. We demonstrate our love to our children in the most excellent manner possible. We demonstrate to the world everything good. Oh, Muslims invented mathematics. Well, that was seven, eight hundred years ago. What about now? What have you done to the world for the last 250 years? Oh, brother, we can't really do anything. We have been master, we have been colonized. You have not been colonized for the last 100 years. You live in Britain. What have you done to become powerful in Britain? Oh, we've been fighting with one another. Yes, of course you have been. You've been fighting over sex. You've been fighting over your madahibs. You've been fighting over your clothes. You've been fighting over your this, that and the other. <coughs> we have been too busy not being excellent but eating ourselves, destroying from within. And the order of Allah in that verse, وَالْإِحْسَانِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ He orders you and I to be the best that there is after being just and fair. And then he says, وَإِيْتَا إِذِ الْقُرْبَى SubhanAllah And don't misunderstand the Arabic word Qurba here meaning to your family. He says, be generous to those who are close to you. The Arabic word Qurba necessarily and most of the time actually means your close members of your family. But here, because the two preceding command is universal, <coughs> the third command in Arabic also therefore is interpreted as universal. It isn't just to my brother and my sister, my wife and my children, my parents. No, it is to everybody, the humanity at large. So here the Arabic word Qurba refers to the human being, the human connection that you have with your fellow human being. Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying, وَإِيْتَا إِذِ الْقُرْبَى And be good, generous, benevolent, magnanimous, kind, compassionate to those fellow human beings who share the same earth as you do. Be kind and generous. Now, brothers and sisters, ask ourselves this one, one simple question. Have we passed in the three criteria of commands? Be just and fair, number one. Be excellent, number two. And number three, be good and kind and compassionate to your fellow human being. Have we passed? I don't think we have. Many brothers have this attitude, or they're not Muslims, we can treat them as we like. No, you can't. No, you can't. Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, when he was entering Jerusalem, I was reading it yesterday actually, because I was writing something, and in that I could read, and I read that the chronicle, the diary that was kept by uh, 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 the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and people around, uh, the companions around, and Umar ibn Khattab's uh, 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 colleagues around, and one of them wrote an account of what happened. When the Muslims had surrounded Jerusalem, the, the priest from inside said, Guys, stop pelting us. Stop attacking us. We don't want to fight anymore. Please, get your leader to come and open the door for us. So they said, okay. So they sent their leader. I think Zubair was their leader at the time. Zubair went. And the priest said, no, you're not the leader. <laughs> Zubair said, why? He goes, the leader that you have is somebody that we've been told about. And we know what he looks like and his, his characteristics. You don't look like one. You're not the leader. 
He said, yes, I know. Our leader is Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. In fact, we'll invite him. So Zubair writes a letter. Umar ibn Khattab reads the letter and he comes over. And he enters Jerusalem wearing a piece of cloth, a garment that has got 14 to 15 stitches and patches. And the companions and all the other colleagues of Umar ibn Khattab, they feel embarrassed. They say, Ya Umar, please change your clothes. Put something white on. And Ya Umar, take the camel and go on a nice horse. And he does. He listens to them. He puts on the, the nice cloak and uh, he put, gets on a horse. And as he's going, he stumbles on his horse. The horse sways and he jumps off his horse and he says to his companion, Oh my people, you want your leader to be perished because of your arrogance of white clothes and your arrogance of your uh, horse? Give me my patchy clothes back and give me my camel for I feel more comfortable in them. And he entered. And as soon as the patriarch so Umar al Khattab radiallahu anhu he said, Yes, you are indeed Umar about whom we've been foretold. You are Umar. Why? Because of his character, because of his goodness to the people, and in the pact that he signed with them, he gave them everything. You shall live here, your property will be protected, your crosses will be protected, your churches will be protected, your streets will be protected, your property, your family, your honor, your intellect, your religion, your faith, everything will be protected. We Muslims will guarantee your protection. Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab wrote this. Many of our young brothers and sisters roaming our neighborhoods are so angry, they think the non-Muslims deserve their attack and vile language and filthy attack constantly. They feel that the Muslims are a recipient of their wrath. They are a deserving recipient of their wrath. No, they are not. Because Allah Azza says, وَإِذَا إِذِ الْقُرْبَى And be generous, not with your money only, with your character and conduct. With your generosity, with your tongue, with your eyes, with your hearing, with your hand. Generosity in every way possible. وَإِذَا إِذِ الْقُرْبَى Three commands again, let me remind you. First one. Adl, be just and fair. Second command is Ihsan. Allah Azza wa Jal says, excellence in everything, doing your best to be the best. And the three, wa ida idil qurba, and be generous and magnanimous to those people around you, fellow human beings around you. These are the three commands of Allah. Rasulullah was explaining to a Bedouin in 10 seconds. Aqul qawli hada, astaghfirullahikum, astaghfirullahikum. الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي كفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters Then Allah says وينها عن الفحشاء And he prohibits from فحشاء What does Arabic word فحشاء actually mean? The understanding of this Arabic word فحشاء is a big one Actually it can't limit it to one word It can't be brought into one single word I call it shamelessness Anything that incites, encourages behavior that creates and destroys the goodness within you, the nature that Allah has given you, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the natural haya that you have, when that's destroyed, it becomes fahsha, fahisha. And Allah is saying He has prohibited that for all of us. Anyone who is true Muslim, my brothers and sisters, must sign up to the standard standard of staying away from immoral activities consciously and unconsciously small or big my brothers and sisters it's about obscenity <coughs> lewdness vulgarity indecency shamelessness anything that is dirty anything that has traits that brings dirtiness all of that is known as fahsha. And Allah is prohibiting that. Let's measure that. When we become angry, how is our tongue? Ask yourself this question. If we are to introduce Islam to the non-Muslims, Allah is saying, Allah is ordering you three things to do, and He's telling you not to do three things. First one of the prohibition is uh, shamelessness. With our tongue, we become shameless when we start talking. We talk filth. <laughs> We talk foul, we swear when we are angry. Wallahi, we have failed. Ask yourself this question again. When was the last time you swore? When was the last time you swore? I can tell you when I swore last night. Allah is my witness. Never. My parents, my family, my friends, 
40 years later, cannot tell you I've sworn even once with them or to them. My father taught me this from the day I was born. He said, my son, do what you do, but never, never discredit, never desecrate the tongue Allah has given you. Never swear. And I've taken that word of my father literally. I hate anyone who swears it at me, and I don't swear. When was the last time you swore? When was the last time your tongue was foul? Rasulullah says, Al Mu'minu Man Salim al Muslimuna Millisanihi wa Yadihi. He is a Muslim only when his neighbor is safe from his hand and his tongue. Fahsha isn't just to be looking at bad things, it's about doing bad things from within. It's about participating in uh, lewd activities, in vulgarity, in engaging in discussions that is not acceptable. And you all know when it's not acceptable. Sometimes when I'm sitting on the train and I hear young people talking behind, Allahu Akbar, Ya Rab, I feel like putting my finger in my ears because my ears are burning and they're Muslim boys and girls. I hear them talking in the most vile language you can think of. Where are their parents? What have their parents taught them? Our brother, we can't teach them much because the schools in fact, no, you can teach them. In fact, you can be involved in school and making sure your children learn to guard their tongue, their eyes, their ears, their body from fahsha, evil, shameful deeds, actually shameful deeds. Well, munkar, the second command of prohibition is munkar, evil. What is evil? Arabic word munkar is actually coming from nakara, to hate, to detest. To dislike. Anything that is disliked is munkar. Anything that is disliked. By who? By your natural state. You know when it is right and when it is wrong. It is inside you. The opposite of munkar is ma'ruf. That which is known well by people that is good. Munkar is something that is hidden and secret because you will be found out and be embarrassed. Ma'ruf is something that you do openly and no shame at all in doing it because it is good. Avoiding evil is a prerequisite to being a good Muslim. And finally, he Azza wa Jal says, well, baghi. Baghi is a big word. Oppression and wickedness is how I put it. But actually, it is wrong, injustice, outrage, transgression, rebellion, all fused into one terminology called baghi. Everything in one. <coughs> Causing trouble, like people are doing in Iraq like the dictators are doing in Middle East in the Muslim world, like America is doing over the world, like Britain is doing with its uh, rotten foreign policies, like Mr. Blair did by taking our country to war against Iraq, like we see in the world, chaos upon chaos, that's called baghi, evil, wrong, all things put together. That's called baghi. And Allah is saying it is prohibited that you should spread baghi on this earth. So, to remind us all, Baghi, my brothers, when it becomes widespread, people lose freedom. Reign of dictatorship and tyranny becomes normal. Oppression becomes normal. Even Muslims begin to support the dictators and despots. I remember in this very masjid, when I spoke up against uh, the Egyptian government, some of you were very upset. How dare I speak against Sisi. La ilaha illallah. I remember some of you went and complained to the committee members, why did I speak against the Bangladeshi government? Some of you complained, why did I speak against the Pakistani government? Some of you complained, why did I speak against what? Every government? You're going to silence me? No! Bahi is Bahi and I'm going to speak against it. If they're doing evil, I should speak against it. And if you find goodness in evil, then there's something wrong. Remember, man ra'a min kumun karan fal yugayyuru biyadihi. If you do see an evil, change it with your hand. Fa in lam yastati' fa bi lisani. If you can't do it with your hand, then speak up against it. Wa in lam yastati' fa bi qalbi. Wa dhalika da'afu al-iman. And if you cannot do it with your tongue, then hate it in your heart. For that is the lowest stage of your iman. And if you cannot hate evil, then you don't even have the lowest stage of iman. If you find goodness in wickedness, if you find goodness in dictators, if you find goodness in illegitimate government, if you find goodness in corruption, if you find goodness in murder and mayhem, if you find goodness in terror and brutality, there is something wrong with our iman. There is something wrong with our iman. My brothers and sisters, 
I feel very passionately about what's going on in the world today, just like you do. In fact, I know you do, but I put my neck out every day. Every day. I get threatened by the Muslims, I get threatened by the non-Muslims. I get threatened by the crazy Muslims, I get threatened by the crazy non-Muslims. Alhamdulillah, I must be doing something good. It doesn't stop me. Because the mission with Allah, mission that Allah has sent you and I with on this earth is to please him only, not be afraid of anybody else. And that's why he says, he says, Baghi, la'allakum inna Allah ya'mu biladu al-ihsan wa ita'id al-ghurba wa yanha'an al-fahshai wa al-munkar al-waghi Then what? Ya'allakum la'allakum tadakkarun, subhanallah. So there can be a constant reminder for you. La ilaha illallah. It can be a constant reminder for you because you'll forget. Allah is being kind. He gives you orders and prohibitions and He says, don't worry, I'll keep on reminding you. 6,600 verses have been revealed as a constant reminder. Whole of the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 23 years of prophethood was a reminder. All the thousands of prophets He sent was a reminder. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. It's a reminder, constant reminder for us to do the right thing. So we must stand for that which is right. Do you, agree? Uh, do you agree with me? We must stand for that which is right. And what is right is justice. What is right is fairness and justice. What is right is excellence. What is right is being good and generous to your fellow human beings. And we stand against all sorts of wrong. What is wrong is shameful deeds, evil, wickedness and rebellion. That's wrong. We Muslims are very clear. And that's the message you would be giving to the non-Muslims from today. Introduce Islam in 10 seconds. Go and introduce Islam to the non-Muslims in 10 seconds. See if you can. I think you can. We can. By exemplifying it in our behaviors first and putting it out in words to others after. In Allah wa malaikatahu salluna ala nabi ya ayuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahu salli ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa sallam اللهم ربنا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم ربنا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا أفرغ علينا صبرا وصبر أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين واحفظنا من الظالمين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزي قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدن قرحنا إنك أنت الوهاب يا فاتر السماوات والأرض أنت ونجنا في الدنيا والآخرة توفنا مسلما والهقنا بصالحين توفنا مسلما والهقنا بصالحين توفنا مسلما والهقنا بصالحين يا رحم الرحيم يا كرم الكرمين accept our prayers يا الله accept our sacrifices يا الله accept everything that we do for you يا رحم الرحيم Ya Kamura, come and protect us, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, protect our brothers and sisters in every, for every part of the world, Ya Allah. Free Al-Aqsa from occupation, Ya Allah. Free Gaza from the troubles, Ya Allah. Ya Alhamdulillah, Rahim, Ya Kamura, come in. Free Syria from the tyrants, Ya Allah. Free Iraq from the troubles and the tyrants, Ya Allah. Free Iraq from the troubles and the problems, Ya Allah. Free Iraq from the troubles and the problems, Ya Allah. Free Somalia from fitna, Ya Allah. Free Kashmir from occupation, Ya Allah. Free Afghanistan from the troubles, Ya Allah. Free Bangladesh from fitna, Ya Allah. Free Pakistan from fitna, Ya Allah. Free Nigeria from from fitna, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman Rahim, free every part of this world, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman Rahim, free this world, Ya Allah. Restore peace on this earth, Ya Allah. Restore peace on this earth, Ya Allah. Enable us so that we can work together to establish justice for your cause, Ya Allah. Enable us so that we can be excellent, Ya Rahman Rahim, in everything that we do. Ya Kamal Al-Kamin, enable us so that we can be those people who are generous to our neighbors and our fellow human beings, Ya Rahman Rahim. Ya Kamal Al-Kamin, strengthen us in our Iman, Ya Allah. Empower us so that we can stay away from shameful deeds, Ya Allah. Empower us so that we can stay away from evil, Ya Allah. Ya Rahman Rahim, empower us so that we can stay away from wickedness and rebellion, Ya Allah. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna kan tasamil alim wa tuba alayna ya baulana inna kan tawabu rahim inna Allah ya'muru biladu bil ihsan wa ita'id al-qurba wa yanha'an al-fahshai wa al-munkan al-baghi ya'adukum la'allakum tadakkarun fadhkurun ya'adukurukum wa shkurun wa la takfurun wa Allahu ya'lumu ma tasna'un aqbi salah.